Go ahead and take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That's where we're going to be today, and uh, that's where we're going to spend most of our time together, because we've talked about how God created us for community. We talked about that two weeks ago. And then last week, uh, Steve talked about how Jesus is the cornerstone of community. Now, I just want to say real quickly that I thought Steve did a phenomenal job last Sunday. Did he not? I mean, for his first time ever preaching in a pulpit in front of you guys, right, I thought he did pretty good. Can we just give him a hand back there? And so... And I don't know what it is about 815, but he said 815 was his best one. So if you were here at 815 last week, you got a treat, all right? So, um, so that, that's awesome. Steve, thank you for, for filling in. And I just tell you, he's, what are you, two weeks into your internship? Crushing it. Crushing it. He makes sure I have coffee, and it's most important, right? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Today, I want to talk about how we engage as the body of Christ, right? And, and here's something, here's something that, I, that, that I want to make sure we grasp at the very beginning, okay? So I want you to repeat after me. We are the body of Christ. Isn't that awesome? Like, I mean, that's amazing, right? That's amazing, yet it comes with great responsibility, and, and, then, and, then, and then we look and we, we hear all of the things, right? And, and, and we talk about them quite often from here, that we're the only army that shoots its wounded. We, we kick each other while we're down. We, you know, all these things, right? And, and, and people have stabbed each other in the back and, you know, gossiped in the hallways and, and all of these different things about the church. The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, turn and walk out the door, deny him by the lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Brennan Manning said that years ago. DC Talk made it famous. Anybody know DC Talk? Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Right. And we say all of these things, and yet I, I, I just wonder from time to time, because we talk about community a lot, because I feel like the church is God's plan to save the world, right? I mean, I mean if you, it, 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 it's kind of what I do, right? I mean, church, it's kind of my life. You guys are kind of it, you know, it. <laughs> Rick apologizes. <laughs> well, anyway, we're getting there, right? But, 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 and, 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 and we hear all these things said, we say all of these things, and, and many of them are true, right? I mean, I'm looking around, I'm seeing people in this room that in the last three, four years, you have been hurt in the last 10, 15 years, you've been hurt, wounded, damaged by a church, by a fellowship, by a, by the body of Christ in somewhere, someplace, right? And, and, and that happens. Yet we are called to be the body of Christ. We're called to be the body of Christ. And there's people all around us right now, this morning, that are not going to go to church today, right? Not because it's Memorial Day weekend, right? Not because of COVID, not because of, you know, any, any of those reasons. But there have been, and, and, and I'm not even talking about the people online because they're coming to church today, right? I, I, saw, I saw we've got some people online this morning, right? You're, you're coming to church, you're making church a priority, whether in your living room or whether you're in the room, right? But, but there, there are people all around us. We know them. Some of them are very near and dear to us, and they're not going to make church a priority today, whether in their kitchen or whether it's South Gorham Baptist Church, right? They're not going to make church a priority today. And one of the main reasons why is that when they look at the church, they see the building. When they look at the church, they see a bunch of flawed, broken people like us. And what I believe people need to see is that they need to see the church like God sees the church. So I want us to see the church like God sees the church this morning. And I want us to hopefully discover our place in the body of Christ. Sound good? All right. So let's explore what the Bible has to say about his church. First Corinthians chapter 12, 
starting in verse 12, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Now, I want to stop right there. This talks exactly what we talked about two Sundays ago, right? We were all created in the image of God. God created us after his image and placed us on the same playing field, right? We are all leveled. We're all, all on the same level. And here's, the, and here's the truth that I need all of us to hear this morning. That means and includes our need for Christ, Right? And so each and every one of us this morning, look around, look around, right? That person you just saw, they're broken. Right? They're broken. Each and every one of us are broken in need of a Savior. What Paul is doing to the church at Corinth, which you want to talk about a messed up church, right? What, what Paul is doing with the church of Corinth is he's showing them their brokenness, that we're all part of the body, and that each and every one needs Christ. That's salvation, isn't it? Salvation is recognizing, coming to a place, coming to grips with the fact that I'm less than without Jesus, and I need Jesus in my life. I mean, that's salvation, right? I come to a place where I recognize my brokenness and my need for Christ. And what, what, what Paul is doing here with the church at Corinth, just as one body, the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. So it is with Christ. And then we blow that up a little bit, right? We blow that up a little bit. Because what that means is that any church that's preaching the gospel of Jesus, the same message and mission of Jesus, guess what that means? Some it's one with them. Right? And they're one with us. And we're all on the same team. Right? We're all on the same team. It's like families. Right? When you look at other families, when you look at your neighbors, right? Anybody have a neighbor that drives you crazy? Anybody? 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 Okay. Right? They're a uh, cat. That was aggressive. Yeah? You just thought of one. Okay. That took a minute. All right. Let's get cat another cup of coffee. Okay. Right, but but we, we chances are we've all lived around somebody or know somebody. Or we drive by that house every day, and you just think, "Hmm, that doesn't make sense." Right? Maybe it's the, maybe it's the maybe it's the, the 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 way they mow their grass or don't mow their grass. Maybe it's the way they leave things out or don't leave things. You know, I mean, what, whatever the case may be, right? Um, may, maybe maybe he mows without his shirt on. Right? And you just kind of look and you're like, what in the world? That was my dad. <laughs> and even from in the house, I'm looking out and I'm like, what in the world? You're going to scare everybody in the neighborhood. Right? Right? But there's things about other families that, that, that don't make sense to us. Right? That's not how we were raised. That's not how we did it. That's not, and, and, and we would even go as far as to say, that's not Right? Parenting styles. We watch other parents, right, in grocery stores, at the Walmart, right, uh, you know, at, at, at Target, right, because, you know, all these different places. And you watch how parents interact and engage with their children, and you look and say, that ain't right, right? That's not right. Or you feel for the kid, or you feel for the parent, right? You, we, we look around, same with churches, right? That doesn't mean, listen to me, listen to me. That doesn't mean just because they're doing it differently than you that it's wrong. Right? Just because it's a different style, right? Just because it's a different way of doing things, just because it's a different method, does not mean that they're doing it wrong. Same with the church. Same with the church. Right? It doesn't mean... It doesn't mean that just because somebody's doing a, a different method or they've got an organ or they've got this or they've got that, they wear suits and ties, right? They, 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 you know, they do um, what, whatever, right? It doesn't mean that they're doing it wrong. It's a different method. 
And as long as, and hear me again, hear me again, because this is the distinction, and we don't have really time to, 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 to dive into this even more, but, but as long as they're preaching Jesus Christ crucified, risen, salvation, the message of salvation, heaven and hell, that those are real places and real people go to both places, right? That, that we can get on the same team, right? We can get on the same team. And that's important for us to realize. We are not the best only gospel preaching church around. We're not. Amen. <laughs> Security. <laughs> so there's one body and it has many members. And all the members are important, <laughs> except for one. <laughs> Keep reading. Verse 14, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. He keeps going here. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I don't belong in the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. What you need to recognize here is that every member, every part of the body, is useful in the work of God. Is useful for the work of God. It's useful for the work of God. Let me tell you, let me tell you one of the places we, we hurt each other, where we, where we uh, kind of wound each other, where we beat each other up, right? Is some of you ears, some of you ears want the mouse to act like an ear, right? And that can't happen, can it? Exactly, right? Jonathan just got scared, right? right? We can't expect the mouth to act like an ear. We can't expect... The eyes to act like a nose. We can't expect the hand to act like a foot, right? All of these different things. And yet we, we put each other, we place each other in these boxes because the reality is, is that there's nothing wrong with that person. You just want that person to be more like you. Here's the issue with that. God developed us. God created us as, look at that verse 18, as he chose so God created you as an ear, God created you as a nose, God created you as a mouth, a foot, a hand, an elbow, right? Some of you an armpit, right? <laughs> God created each and every one of you as he chose. And he's God, and he gets to do that, right? We don't get to mold and make and shape people into the people that we want them to be because it makes us feel better or makes us more comfortable, Right? I would rather you not be as much of an eye or an ear, but I'd rather you just uh, be a mouth and keep it shut. <laughs> right? And, 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 but yet we, we place these expectations on each other that aren't fair. If you're an ear, be an ear. Right? If you're, if you're not outgoing, right? If you're not the most welcoming person, if you're not interactive, so i.e. if you're not Dan Garrish or Lois Hardy, right? Why would we expect you to be? Right? We don't expect you to be. I want you to be the best Alex that God has called you to be. I want you to be the best Becky. I want you to be the best Randy that God has called you to be because God chose you and created you to do that. To be that. He shaped you that way. Let's look at the rest. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, verse 21, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Did you get that? The parts that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greatest honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which are more, which are more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, 
but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So God levels the playing field. We're all part of the body. Right, And then we see that every part, however God chose us to create us to be, is useful for his mission. And we have a responsibility to value each other accordingly. We have a responsibility to value each other accordingly. Right? God has composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division In the body. That's God's plan for the church, right? That there be no division in the body. Jesus, Jesus in John 17, when he's praying to the Father, right? And and, and, and I know we talk about this often because it's very moving, it's very impactful, it's very foundational for the body of Christ, right? That Jesus prayed for three groups of people in his final prayer on his way to the cross. He prays for his disciples, the first five verses. Then he takes the next section, the longest section in the chapter, the longest section in his prayer, and he prays for himself, for what he's about to endure, for what he's about to experience. And then lastly, he prays for all of those who would believe, which means if you're a believer in Jesus this morning, on the way to the cross, you were on the mind of Christ and he prayed for you. You know what he prayed for you? I'm glad you asked. He prayed that you would all be one as he and the Father are one. Jesus prays for the unity of the church. Paul preaches to the church at Corinth about there being no division in the way that God created us because that was how God designed the body of Christ to be, that there would be no division, that the hand wouldn't fight with with the foot because the foot wasn't doing what the hand did, that the nose wouldn't fight with the ear because the ear wasn't listening right? That there would be no division, but that the church would be one as Jesus and his father are one. Paul even goes as far as to say to the church in, 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 uh, in Philippi, Philippians chapter 4, he says, I entreat Judea and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Judea and Syntyche, they had a disagreement. They were both part of the body of Christ. They were both in the church at Philippi, right? But they had a disagreement, commentators say. And Paul says, I entreat them, I beg them, I call them to agree in the Lord um, because, because there's a greater mission at hand, right? And what Paul is saying there is, I ask them to knock it off, right? To stop arguing and complaining about things that don't matter in the church of Jesus Christ. God's plan for his body, God's plan for the body of his son, the church, you and me here in 2021 is unity. No division, togetherness, that we would be exactly who God created to be as difficult or as, 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 um, much of a blessing as we may be, right? Both ends of the spectrum, right? To be one. To be one. To be one. No division. No division. No division. And I love what Paul closes this section with there. As you, as, if you look at verse 26, if one member suffers... All suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Together. Right? Together. I don't know about you, but there is something to me, every time I watch it, I just get stirred. Has anybody ever seen the Mighty Ducks? Okay. You know, we're watching the Mighty Ducks, the series. It's a little mini-series that's built off of the movies and yada, yada, yada. And we we watched the season finale Friday night. Okay. And Gordon Bombay, right, walks in the locker room in between the second and third period. The Ducks are down, right? They're losing. And he comes in and he gives this speech. 
right? Ducks fly together, right? Ducks fly together. And then the music starts to rise, right? And everybody starts to get that belief in their eyes that we can win this thing, right? And then they go out there, and in the last 20 seconds of the game, what happens? I'm not going to spoil it for you, <laughs> right? But ducks fly together, right? And as I was thinking about that Friday night, watching this, remembering the first time I ever saw the Mighty Ducks, the movie, and, and watching, watching the, the locker room speech, right? It's kind of like the one in Miracle, right? With, that's based on the true story with the U.S. hockey team and all that. Be, um, but anyway, but anyway, I, I was thinking about it Friday night, how ducks fly together. And I'm like, yes, the church is a group of ducks, <laughs> right? And we're called to fly together, and how beautiful it is, I didn't like a group of ducks is what I should say. Like a group of ducks. I'm not calling you a duck, okay? Like a group of ducks, right? How beautiful it is when the church, each person within the body of Christ recognizes their role, recognizes their role, embraces their role, and flies together. Isn't that awesome? If you've ever been on a mission trip, you've probably seen this, right? You've probably seen this, where different people embrace their role in different places, right? Different people embrace their role in different places, and it all works together for the good. And you come home so filled because you just experienced the body of Christ in a week where you served together. And everybody filled their different roles, and it was beautiful. All right, three things I want to talk about from this passage. First thing we see in that first section, right? God levels the playing field. We see our placement in the body of Christ. We see our placement in the body of Christ. These verses are not just symbolic language. They reveal a mysterious but literal spiritual truth that when we receive Jesus as our Savior, we literally become a part of the spiritual body of Christ. The phrase in Christ or in Christ Jesus or in the Lord are used this way almost a hundred times in the New Testament. About a hundred times in Christ, in Christ Jesus, in the Lord. And so this truth is extremely important. When you place your trust in Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus literally comes to live in your heart. But at the same time, the Holy Spirit places you into the body of Christ. Well, listen to a couple other places where this is mentioned. Romans 8.1 there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. Ephesians 2.13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have, have been made near by the blood of Jesus. Ephesians 2.6 tells us that God raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Jesus. You get the point? That when we come to God in salvation, Jesus comes and lives in our heart, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're placed in the body of Christ. You're in the, you're, you're in the team. You're on the team, right? You're part of the team. You are valuable and necessary in the body of Christ. Every one of us. We're valuable and necessary in the body of Christ. That's our placement, that we are in Christ. I don't know about you, but that's encouraging, right? To know that I'm in Christ. I'm covered by Jesus. Second thing, we see our value to the body of Christ. Again, it uh, does not consist of one member, but of many. Verse 14, the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong in the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. And if an ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. Let me tell you what the enemy loves to do. Okay? Because Jesus, Paul, all throughout the New Testament, we see the institution of the church, right? Because Jesus had such big plans for the church that, that, that we would be one as he and the Father are one, that there would be no division, right? The enemy loves to come in and divide the church. I mean, there, there is nothing, I believe, that the enemy enjoys more than, than when churches are going at each other, when churches are splitting, when people are gossiping, when there's any ounce of division within the church, right? And, 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 and all culture likes to do is put these levels 
put these levels on us, right? These, these socioeconomic levels, right? I mean, I was, at, I, was at, I was at a theme park last weekend, and I saw these levels, right? You've got, you've got the normal people that go into the normal line, but then you can pay more than the price of your ticket, and you can get these express passes, and all the people in the normal line just hate you right? Because you're express. Then there's even another level that's called VIP. And you get a private escort through the back door of the ride and you get on the exit of the ride. And then those people are throwing food at you, (laughs) right? I mean, I mean, everybody, everybody, if you're VIP, look out, right? Because there's a hot dog coming your way and it's probably from me. Right, but but we but we do this. We do this constantly. We do this constantly, and the, and the and the and the enemy doesn't succeed more than when he has division in the church. Than when there's division in the church, there's nothing he wants more, and we see our value in the body of Christ. And so and so when 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 someone when someone uh, when someone comes to me. When someone comes to me, and I want to be real sensitive here because there's a difference between a call of God and division and doubt, okay? Okay, well, when someone co- comes to me and says, I don't feel like there's a place for me here anymore. That's the enemy. That's the enemy. Especially when, especially when, let me tell you the difference. Unless they say, but God has called me here, Right? Because God doesn't call us away from a place without calling us to a place. You hear me? God doesn't call us away from a place without calling us to a place. And so, and so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm always burdened with the person that comes to me and says, listen, God's called me away. Well, where's God's called you to? Nowhere. I just know I don't fit in here anymore. That's the enemy. That's the enemy. Let me tell you why. Because in the family of God, you always have a place. In the family of God, there's always a place for you. There have been times, probably no doubt, right, that you've felt like you don't belong in your workplace, where you don't belong in your own family, where you don't belong in your church family, where you don't belong. And the enemy feeds this doubt in you. But listen, you belong. If God took Travis out of the Bush family, I hope that there would be a gap. Right? That there would be a gap. Definitely at mealtime. Right? Right? There's a place for me in my family, right? There's a place for me. There's a place of value for me in my family. And the enemy loves to come and whisper in our ears and say, hey, they don't really need you. Hey, you're not really doing anything there. You're not really valuable there anymore. But listen, you have value. I can't tell you. Let's keep going. We see our value in the, play, in, the, in the body of Christ. We see value. And the point is that every part of the body is significant. And then lastly, he talks about our purpose in the body of Christ. Look at verses 20 through 22. If all were a single member, where would the body be? And it is, there are many parts, yet one body, that I cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. We all have great purpose in the body of Christ. Jesus calls us to live a life of service, of godly service, and we're designed to serve together in the body of Christ. The feet serving the hands, the eyes serving the ears, so on and so forth, right? And the foot in verse 15 walks and the hand holds. The ear hears, the eyes sees. We all have purpose in the body of Christ. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. 
um, verses 32 through 35, shows how we model community. It shows how we model community. Look there, Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. Now the full member, full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving the testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. And we see here the results of the body of Christ working as the body of Christ. What Paul is calling to the church at Corinth to later, right? This is the model. This is the model for the church of Acts, right? This was, this was a time after Acts chapter 2 that we preached on for the first part of the year, right? But we see that the body of Christ is still intact here. Because we hear some of the same language, right? The full number of those who believed were of one heart, one soul. They had everything in common. The great power was with them, right? They were giving, they were sharing, they were generous with each other. And so how do I model community? Three things. Number one, be committed to one another. Be committed to one another, right? Be committed to one another. Let those around you know that, 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 that you're there. The full number of those who believed were of one heart, one soul. No one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Be committed to one another. One of the things I like talking about with the, with the basketball teams that I'm around is this. Did you know that it takes absolutely zero talent? It takes no talent whatsoever to be a good teammate. You don't have, to, you don't have to, to shoot well, pass well, dribble well, play good defense to be a good teammate. It takes no talent to cheer your teammates on. It takes no talent to say, nice shot. It takes no talent to give a high five or a fist bump, right? It takes no talent to, to encourage and lift up your teammates at the end of a tough game. It takes zero talent to be a good teammate. Well, listen, church, it takes zero talent to be a good teammate and, be, and to be committed to one another. Right? The, the writer of Hebrews, don't neglect meeting together as is the habit of some, but all the more as you see the day drawing near. Right? Be committed to one another. Can the person across the aisle depend on you? Can they depend on you? Right? Can they depend on you? Can they count on you to be there? Can they count on you to pray for them? Can they count on you to be there? Number two, how do I model community? Be committed to one another. Number two, be courageous. Look at what they were doing. Verse 33. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. They were sharing the gospel. And all they were doing was testifying about what God was doing in each and every one of their lives. And, and, and God did the rest. All God asks of us is to be faithful to share our testimony what God's doing in our lives. That's all he asks of us, right? He'll do the rest. He's going to prepare the hearts. He's going, to, he's, going to, he's, he's going to draw them into himself, right? All he asks of us is to be faithful. And this is the type of faith that God wants us to have. 2 Timothy 1.7, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love of self-discipline. And God is looking for courageous followers who are willing to risk everything to be courageous for the gospel. To be faithful to the gospel. And then lastly, show compassion and care. There was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses, sold them, brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Show compassion and care. Whether it's babysitting, whether it's taking a gift basket, whether it's just giving a hug, whether it's praying with someone, whether it's giving a ride, whether it's just being there, taking them to a meal, taking them to a cup of coffee, showing compassion and care. Be committed to one another. Be courageous. Be compassionate and caring. Be compassionate and caring. That's how we model being the church. And I want to give you the why one more time. If you look at Ephesians chapter 5. Look at 
one of the most, hmm, I don't want to say most, one of the more misquoted passages, misused passages that we have in Scripture. Ephesians chapter 5. Not to take anything away from it, but wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even Christ is the even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that that, uh, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Verse 32, don't miss this. This mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. What I want you to see from this passage is this. God loves the church. And we should too. God loves his church. God gave his son so that we could do this. So that we could do this. So that we could do this. So that we could sing together. So that we could open his word together. So that we could encourage one another. So that we could be compassionate to one another. So that we could fight together. So that we could mourn together. So that we could cry together. So that we could celebrate together. So that we could do one another's together. And I know. This morning. We don't always get it right. And it's much easier to pick out the five things that went wrong on a Sunday morning than, the, than to celebrate the 20 that went right. We were leaving that theme park last Saturday night. And we had had the same guy twice take our tickets and scan them on the way in. We had, we'd had the same guy in about five hours. And both times, he was like one of the nicest welcome people. It was like Dan Garrish went to work at this theme park. I mean, it was like unreal. And we were leaving, and I noticed these two guys that, that clearly didn't fit in, but they worked there. And I said, hey, do you guys run this like check-in spot? And they were like, yes. And immediately one of them looked at me and was like, what's the problem? And I said, absolutely nothing. We've had a great day. We've had a great weekend. And I just want you to know, this guy, Jay, right here, was awesome. Twice. We had him twice take our tickets. And he did a phenomenal job. And he's welcoming. And I just wanted to tell you that Jay is crushing it. Right? And they looked at me in shock. <laughs> uh, 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 thank you. Thank you. Right? We, we, appreci we appreciate it. And I left, went on the way. Right? But you could tell those guys had not heard that narrative as often as they'd heard everything that's gone wrong, right? And I'll confess, that's me. Anytime someone says, hey, I need private time with you, I'm starting to brace myself. Oh, no. Who said what? Who did what? What do we have to clean up on aisle 12 for now? <laughs> right? And you almost brace yourself for the beating that is about to ensue. Right? And then when they come in and they say, hey, we just want to celebrate with you. Right? I just got to tell you about this lady that wants to get her baby dedicated. Or I just got to tell you about this. Or I just got to tell you about that. My, my son is asking questions about Jesus and you just want to you just want to like 
get up and hug them, right? Because they're not coming in and whipping you. Shouldn't we expect the former and the body of Christ? If Christ was so in love with this, the idea of this, the mission of this, right? We should spend way more time celebrating what God's doing than ripping apart what God's doing. We were in an elder meeting recently, and we were talking about what to do. And, and one of our elders spoke up and just said, said something that floored me. And I'm not saying this in, in, in a boastful way. I'm celebrating this. I'm celebrating this because it's God. That over the past 14, 15 months, when other churches have really struggled, we've grown. That in the past 14, 15 months, I was having a conversation with somebody last night where pastors are experiencing anxiety, fear, pastors are being cut to part-time, and, and all of these things over the past 14, 15 months. It's been a hard season in the church. We've seen nothing but blessing. We've got a capital campaign that's doubling. We've got, all, we've got people meeting Jesus at a Good Friday service. We've got, I mean, just unbelievable things happening. And that elder said, I think it's not a time for us to look around, but to keep our eyes on Jesus. And so anytime you're tempted to look around and say, man, that grass looks greener, or this, this is, you know, all of these different things, right? Staying home is much more comfortable, especially at 815. Remember, how much Jesus loved this. So much so he gave his life for it. That we could have each other. That we could do this together. So let's be committed to one another. Let's be courageous when it's hard. When things don't make sense. And let's show compassion and care to one another. No matter what. Because that's the church. Amen.